1492, Christopher Columbus discovers the West, a part of the Spanish Armada that came over here to form a new world. They discovered this island and they named it Santiago. Our ancestors who were part of the cargo in the transatlantic slave trade wondered if this place was Zamayaka, which is an ancient language from the Akan people in Ghana. It means, are we here permanently? Shortly after the British and the Portuguese got into a war and the British ending, end up winning the actual war and they renamed the island to Jamaica. Whether Zamaica and Jamaica somehow intertwined, it's irrelevant. The British founded their own country here on the island. However, there's more to that story. The very same people that was a part of the transatlantic slave trade, our ancestors, they were able to fight the British and form their own country within this country, the real Wakanda, the Maroon Kingdom. On the continent of Africa, in the country of Ghana, there once had a place, a great kingdom called Judah. In that kingdom, many tribes of our people existed until the Portuguese came and abducted our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, and brought them to the shores of Elmina, where they took us from that shore, past the great divide of the Atlantic Ocean, and to the new world here, Jamaica. One of the shores that they brought us to was St. Mary, and they had plans for our lives to be subjugated forever. But within our people rose a queen warrior, Nani, who had different plans for our people's future. In Africa, they would consider Nani a Mino, or Mino, it means our mother. And our mother brought us a new freedom. So we're here on the shores of uh, Portland in Jamaica. And this reminds me of when I was on Elmina shores in Ghana. And just hearing the waters crashing against uh, the rocks, it's just something spiritual that connects. You just think like, damn, all the way from Ghana on that boat, all the way to here. The Breaker Islands, Jamaica. Haiti was also one of them as well. And these guys, they wanted to form a whole new world off the backs of our labor. And just thinking about, look at what we can do now. 500 years ago, this wasn't the case. Our ancestors put up one hell of a fight to get us to be free today. Okay, so I'm here in the Maroon Kingdom, more town specifically. We're not too far from Nanny's Bump Grave. I'm here at my brother's house, Yao, uh, Y-A-W, that's how he pronounced his name, I'll spell his name as well. And um, we're gonna get some food. I'm here with his family, and she's gonna share out some, you know, good old fashioned, traditional Caribbean food found from the land, all natural. So we've prepared for lunch today. We've prepared breast prunes that's been roasted and then fried. And we've got steamed bami. We've got pumpkin rice. We've got some brown stew chicken. We've got some steamed fish. We have got chickpea curry that is done. Chickpea, pumpkin, carrots, green pepper, 
sweet peppers and it's done in a nice curry sauce and we've got some vegetable shawarma in with the selections of vegetables we've also got carcoon carcoon is actually a traditional maroon dish and it comes in a form of a bean that you have to roast then you um, this is actually the bean you roast it you take off the brown bits and once you've taken off the brown skin you need to soak it for about five or six days and then it's ready to eat it you can eat raw or you can cook it and I've done that in coconut milk and then I've got homemade lemonade lemon from my nice tree over there we have got sorrel beetroot and ginger drink and we have got fresh water from the spring at the back of the house now the passion for cooking cooking is something that I love and without blowing my own trumpet, I'm quite good at it because I've done it for 35 years and I've honed my skills, perfect my skills. I've learned different type of cooking, Chinese, French, Italian, a bit of Indian cooking. But my speciality obviously is Caribbean cooking. I love it and I still do it now because I love it, not because I have to, just because I love it. First thing I'm eating is a, the cocoon bean. Mm. Hold on. No way to dislike this. <laughs> okay, we're here at the beginning of the trek. Where to next? Well, we're going to do the hike to the Nine Falls. Um, you know, so yeah. Right, so ready? let's do our hike to Nine Falls. So this right here is what separates us from the British. Mm. So generally you'd see pictures with the British, yeah? Mm. And they're in their big red coats and so forth. So ancestors could have spot them from a mile out. You know, um, our ancestors were like maybe 10, 15, 18 million steps ahead of them. Mm. You know, in, in how we, 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 we were in battle with them and so forth. Mm. So this is called ambush. Oh. Or this is the, the carcoon vine. Okay. You know, the same bean the largest bean it's the largest bean um that we'd use so this is it and it grows in a pod like yeah. any other pea yeah um so this is what our ancestors used to use to wrap themselves in it's the first camouflage ever mm. before this there was them in them big red coat so our ancestors would have wrapped themselves in it the camouflage uh, yeah themselves. yeah so they could hide ambush. in the bush, yeah, they ambush them. And that's where they get the term They're ambush, ambush from, from, yeah. Oh. So they would wrap themselves in it and cover themselves so they could be able to hide in the bushes. So they could, you know, yeah. to blend with the area and so forth. So this is what set us apart from them. So it's the first source of camouflage ever. The, the Americans start using camouflage about 1777. So that is after... They learned you know, from us. Yeah. So as I said, we were like, a million steps ahead of them. Is that soap? Is huh? that soap? Oh no. Oh, what plant is that? We call it ginger kitty or soap bush. Soap bush. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't have to buy another. Yes. Right here in the And so and this too would like would use it to stuff the wounds of animals as well. Mm -hmm. To keep away the flies like you know, from it rotten, you know, and stuff. So yeah, it's also a, a, a medicine. You know, we use it to wash our pots, our plates and stuff like that. Nice. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So our ancestors really and truly every um the, the the environment provide everything for them. Mm -hmm. From shelter to food to medicine. Weapon. Cleaning you know, agents. Yeah, cleaning agents. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, so the environment is what they always use to, you know, that's why I was telling you before. They were like a million steps ahead of the British because everything within the space was, you know, for them to use, you know, to protect them in every way they could, you know. So, as you hear from Brother Maurice, y'all, this is soap bush. And as you can see right now in this truck, 
I am sweating, so let's clean the face. We use up most of it, but we we'll get some of it last out of it. Wash off my face. Nothing better than clean river water. That's what on earth. There are a lot of different locations and places in the Maroon Kingdom that had a name that was then renamed based on some of the people of the time that influenced it. One of these places were the Great Negro Town, which was then renamed to Nanny Town when she gathered the most of her people from the oppressors um, who were enslaving them there. And in that location, there was a falls there that I don't think I had a name to it, but because Nanny used to bathe there and wash her clothes there and do all types of stuff at the falls, they renamed the actual falls to Nanny Falls. Here in Moortown in the Maroon Kingdom, it reminds me a lot of um, King Gezo's kingdom of the Mino people and there's a big correlation between the two of them when you think about their women, right? So the Mino people, obviously I explained to you guys that means our mothers, they were elephant hunters, there were royal guards, there were scavengers, and they even became um, military personnel uh, for King Gezo's empire and other kings um, throughout uh, West Africa that had Mino people. And when you look at like what they've done in the versatility versus what Nanny has done here in Jamaica, we can't necessarily conclusively say that Nanny was a part of their tribe. However, in the spirit of the culture for the Mino people, the Mino people actually, um, Nanny did a lot of um, diverse things. Um, she practiced obia. She used medicine to heal her people. She was a strategist. She was a surveyor of the land, which goes apart to being a strategic, um, you know, a, a, a per military personnel because she had to lead her people. She was a community leader. She founded the great Negro town now known as Nanny Town. And she was a great warrior as well. She even partook on the battlefield and helped set up the Maroon Kingdom. So when you look at the correlation between um, her ancestry, she did a good job to represent um, the Mino. Here in the Cromanti Kingdom, the Maroon Kingdom, Africa's Kingdom on the island of Jamaica, this is the real Wakanda. Not only do you have your warriors and your kings such as um, King Taki and your warrior queens like Queen Nani, but just the way this place is sovereign onto the island, a complete separate um, place from the actual British Commonwealth of Jamaica. Jamaica is free and independent, but it's not sovereign. Here we are at Queen Nani's bump grave. You can see it right behind me. This is a very important spot for the Maroon Kingdom, especially Moor Town. This is Nanny's town. They used to call this place the Great Negro Town. That was its ancient name when it was first formed. But this is the community that Nanny brought most of our ancestors out of our bondage from the British. And this is where they fortified themselves, they strategized and planned to go into guerrilla warfare as when we was up on the trek and Maurice was talking about the ambush and like their skills is ridiculous and Nani was their leader and this is what I'm talking about in terms of like the Mino people right the, this ability is attributed to Queen Nani and it shows our connection across the great divide of the Atlantic Ocean these are the properties that form our, our heroes and heroines of this country now known as Jamaica, but we're specifically speaking about the African Maroons. This is the real Wakanda, and these are the real Mino people of the real Wakanda, the African Maroon. Concluding our adventurous hike up here and a learning experience, 
A lot of the things that we go through in life or that we, we see in movies and that we read in books take a lot of reference out of African history. In fact, in the entire world takes a lot of reference from African history. A lot of scholars who have traveled the world and the known world found out that there were civilizations long before the great empires of the Europeans or the Spaniards or the Asians. And they realized that a lot of this stuff comes from Africa. And in today's time, in today's medium, they rewrite these stories using these references and we don't realize that a lot of this stuff comes from our African culture, our African heritage. The real Wakanda, the Maroon Kingdom here on the island of Jamaica, a kingdom within a kingdom. This is the real story of the Black Panther, the real Mino Queen, Queen Nani. Until next time, I am African. African history is 365 days a year.